us worship God. We come to seek the ways of wisdom. We come as one body of Christ. We come to find peace and the songs of love for our lives. We come to be refreshed by the Spirit. Come, let us worship. Life-giving God, your love and light guides us on the path of courage, compassion, generosity, and grace. Lead us as we seek to follow your transformative love that turns sorrow into joy and despair into hope. Oh God, help us embrace your guiding light, love that calls us to live as your faithful witnesses as we reflect your grace and redemptive love. God, open hearts to receive your gracious love and strengthen us to carry the good news of your healing power found in the light, 
love, and the life of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we read from the lectionary again, and this time it's not a post-Easter reading, but in fact happens just before Jesus is arrested and crucified. We remember these events traditionally on Monday, Thursday, just before Good Friday. And it's a final discourse that Jesus has with his disciples. It ends with a poignant prayer, and that's what we're reading this morning. It is important to note that the author of the gospel writes decades after Jesus' death and his resurrection to express a persecution, persecuted community's longing for sustained connection with, one, with the one who is the source of their identity, their ultimate hope, Jesus the Christ. Listen then for this word of God where Jesus is in prayer and we hear the words that he shares. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. And now they know everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, and they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them, and in your name that you have given me, I guarded them. Not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Yes, they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. As we begin our reflection on this text, let me open with just a short word of prayer. We are warned, warmed by your Son, encircled by your love, blessed by your presence and sustained by your Spirit. You gather us into the church family and give us a song in our hearts, laughter in our lips, and kindness on our touch. Help us to hear your word and to be challenged by your mission in this community. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray and serve. Amen. The title for this sermon, if we were to print a bulletin, would say, Gone But Not Forgotten. And it didn't come to me after listening to Gina's last service two weeks ago, but it could have. No, it's come to me on my drive home from several memorial services or funerals of a good friend, and I remember specifically a family member, and I would say that phrase to myself, gone but not forgotten. I am guessing you have said those words following the death of a loved one as well. The gospel text for today includes this final conversation between Jesus and his disciples. 
as they end, it's recorded, Jesus went off to pray. This prayer that we have read today is from the words of Jesus under the pressure of imminent arrest and execution. He knows what's coming. Yes, these words are an expression of farewell to his dear friends. And during the seventh week of the Easter season, the wider church actually celebrates what is called Christ's ascension and his departure from this world. Jesus is gone, but certainly the presence of Christ cannot be forgotten by his followers. The gift of the Holy Spirit enables us to be connected to that continuing presence in all of our lives. We are now called to embody Christ's presence in the world every day. This prayer is the instruction for the followers and now it is informative for us. Gone but not forgotten. This chapter of John is sometimes referred to as the high priestly prayer. It consists of a series of appeals to God for the mission of the church and those who are and will be serving in Christ's name. There are four petitions and the main thrust is for the protection of those who serve. The request is meant to shield the new followers of Jesus from the evil that thrives in the world. Jesus sees the people who are faithfully following him as being in the world, but not of the world. He prays for the church not to be taken out of the world, but that his followers might be guarded from the powers that might destroy things in the world. If we go to verse 20, Jesus addresses you and me directly. Through the centuries, Believers have, called, have been called to identify with Christ in their own life of faithfulness. We need to ask ourselves, do we genuinely have a sense of Christ's presence being with us? Do we experience the transformative heart which runs counter to the culture in the real world? Are we willing to risk doing what Christ has shown us through his modeling of the faithful life? Are we joyful as a community in our journey of faithfulness in response to God's grace? No. This word was needed in the early church to which John was addressing, and it's also needed for us today. Yes, we need to relate to Jesus Christ not as some historical figure, but as a continuing presence in all of our lives. Christ is alive in the transforming power through us where we live. But we're not of the world because we walk to the beat of a different drummer, God's life in us. Jesus declared I am the light of the world, and his followers continue to shine that light on the world's darkness. Love lived out through Christ, and those who follow him afterwards will overcome the hatred and the oppression that is in the world. The climax, in a sense, comes with the following. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one, as we are one. Now I'm coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Jesus prays to God for protection for all his followers. It's not a request to put them aside or to hide them out or to isolate them as new believers. No because as Christians, we are called to be in, but not of the world. But again, the question comes, what kind of Christians will we be? If in name only, then we are no different than anyone by any other title. 
If we struggle with the way of faithfulness, we may expect to experience some hostility and confrontation. We also may become open to new encounters with the divine and understand more fully our purpose in living in relationship to Christ's spirit. Marcus Borg has written in a book, The God We Never Knew, and he puts it so succinctly of what this calling is all about. The invitation of the Christian gospel is to enter into the relationship in which our healing and wholeness lie. Yes, that relationship which transforms us by beginning to heal the wounds of existence and makes our lives in the here and now a life with God. The very heart of Christianity is the heart of God, a passion for our personal transformation and the transformation of our world. And we never are alone in this process as Christ lives on within our very beings. Gone, but not forgotten. Yes, there is the promise. The promise of a living presence, his spirit to grow in the way of faithfulness as we make an impact on the world. I'd like to share two stories this morning. The first one comes from Mother Teresa. She wrote before her death about a story of a new sister who had just come. Yes, I remember one of our sisters who had graduated from the university. She came from a well-to-do family that lived outside of India. According to our rule, the very next day, after joining our society, the postulates must go to the home of the dying and destitute in Calcutta. Before the young sister went, I told her, you saw the priest during the mass with what love and with what delicate care he touched the body of Christ during the Eucharist. Make sure you do the same when you get to the home because Jesus is there in the distressing disguise. So she went, yes, this young postulate went for three hours and then she came back. That girl from the university who had seen and understood so many things academically came to my room with such, beautiful, such a beautiful smile. And I asked her for three hours, what's been happening? What did you do? For three hours, I've been touching the body of Christ, she said. They brought a man from the street who had fallen into a drain and been there for many hours and he was covered with maggots and dirt and his wounds were open. And though I found it very difficult, I cleaned him and I knew I was touching the body of Christ. Wow, such power. Howard Thurman, the preacher now deceased from Boston University, left us also a wonderful story in slightly different direction. He wrote, I watched him for a long time. He was busily engaged in the task that he did not notice my approach until he heard my voice. He was an old man. Yes, I discovered before our conversation was over a full 81 years old. Further talk between us revealed that he was planting a small grove of pecan trees. The little treelets were not more than two and a half or three feet in height. My curiosity was unbounded. And so I asked, why did you not select larger trees so as to increase the possibility of your living to see them bear at least one cup of nuts? He fixed his eyes directly on my face and with no particular point of focus, but with a gaze that took in the totality of my features. He went on to say, these small trees 
are cheaper and I have very little money. So you do not expect to live to see the trees reach sufficient maturity to bear fruit. No, he said. But is that important? All my life I have eaten fruit from trees that I did not plant. Why should I not plant trees to bear fruit for those who may enjoy them long after I am gone? Besides, the man who plants because he will reap the harvest has no faith in life. Years have passed since that sunny afternoon in the Grange, Georgia, when those words were said. Again and again, the thought has come back to me. Besides, the man who plants because he will reap the harvest has no faith in life itself. The fact is that much of life is made up of reaping where we have not sown, planting where we shall never reap, and all of life is a planting and a harvesting, almost always on behalf of others. No one gathers merely the crop that they themselves have planted. We eat the fruit from trees planted by others. We must plant trees for others so that they too may enjoy the fruit in the future. Such wisdom, yes, so appropriate. Have we not enjoyed eating from trees planted by many before us? We live in New Hampshire, yes, where they tap maple trees in the spring for the sap to make syrup. Many of these trees are over 100 years old, and the syrup is wonderful and joyfully sweet. Yes, where can we plant some trees using our resources to help others find joy in their lives? Where can we find those causes where people come who are hungry? those places where people may need shelter, or those times when people come to find a friend who will listen. It's a wonderful image for our sharing as we go forward. Where can you and I plant trees, knowing we will never see or consume the fruit the trees may produce? Where can you and I share from our resources and help sustain and support the lives of those in need? Where can we change the world or maybe make the first little change, knowing still others may have to do the next step going forward? Where? Questions. Let me conclude, because there is so much for us to do that we can no longer make excuses. This congregation is now in a time of transition. The ministry will be changing. The directions will be new and possibilities will be put in the past. But there's work to be done. And as we share the love of Christ through our daily lives, you are needed. Don't hesitate anymore. Now we need to be connected with others to reverse the trend toward isolation to encourage a more meaningful sense of what it means to be the church family, a sense of community. And may we always remember, Jesus Christ is gone, but not forgotten. The text we have read comes just before the followers leave and walk to a garden where Jesus will be betrayed and arrested and he prays for them, for their protection, for their safety. He prays that they will not be abandoned to the world with all its ambiguity and riskiness. He prays that their joy will be full. Gone but not forgotten. For you, for me, for the joys of life still to come. 
Be the people of God this week and every day. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, we come specifically remembering several prayer requests. The lackey's daughter, Anne, and her husband, David, Merle Taylor's friend, Carol, all of which have some special needs. And maybe you're remembering some today too as well. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's someone a long distance away, but you've heard their news. Include their names in our prayers this day. Let us pray. Eternal God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Help us always to be aware of your presence in our world around us and also within us to the very depths of our souls. Teach us to be grateful for all the experiences of life, for the pain that alerts us to impending danger, for the strength of character that comes as we face problems and overcome them, for every true joy and accomplishment in our daily lives. Strengthen this day our faith in life. Teach us anew of the Christ who did not come to make our lives easy, but to make us equal to life. Help us to keep steadily in mind the things of life which really matter, not just our houses and our lands, not our comforts and pleasures, but truth, honor, and justice without which we are poor indeed. Make us always sensitive to the vast goodness and opportunities surrounding our lives. Teach us to see beauty in the midst of common routine, to find some joy in all of life. Give us an ear to the hidden music about us, the laughter of children, the blessedness of happy memories, the quiet comfort of our homes. For in our own way, many bring with them personal concerns. Hear them, these prayers and these thoughts. And Holy God, be with those today that we see on the news, those in India who struggle with COVID and so many deaths in their families, those that stand at our own border and wonder what day will bring them joy, when they will see family again. Yes, and those who are in our court system who struggle with what justice might mean in their lives. Be with all of us. Be with those who are hungry, those who need shelter. Be with us as we seek to reach out with Christ's love. And now may we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
go forth into the world in peace and be of good courage. May we hold fast to that which is good and render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Heal the afflicted. Honor and serve all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And now, by the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, be and abide with you and those whom we love this whole world over. Amen. Thank you.